Welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. This week we welcome Dr. Jesse Ehrenfeld, President-Elect of the American Medical Association, on the dangers of anti-trans legislation and threats to Medicaid and Medicare. Now, here are your hosts, Mark Maselli and Margaret Flinter. In June, our guest will make history when he becomes the president of the American Medical Association with its nearly 300,000 members. The AMA is one of the most powerful and influential voices in healthcare. Dr. Jesse Ehrenfeld will be the first openly gay person to hold the office of AMA president, and he's taking on that role right as LGBTQ healthcare is under extreme attack in the United States. Well, Dr. Ehrenfeld, welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you all today. Yeah, and congratulations on your election to the AMA presidency. Uh, it, you've been a longtime advocate for the rights of trans people and we're at this interesting uh, moment in time when we're watching across the United States state lawmakers introducing hundreds of pieces of legislation focused in on banning aspects of gender affirming medical care. And according to the data from the ACLU, the AMA has stated that such care is medically necessary and potentially uh, life-saving for transgender youth. Talk to our listeners about how dangerous uh, this restrictive legislation is? Well, the AMA and, and I are deeply concerned about what functionally is government intrusion into healthcare. And unfortunately, um, these restrictive laws um, continue to reduce access for what we know is appropriate, evidence-based, medically indicated care. And any ban restriction that puts the government into that patient-physician relationship um, risks devastating health consequences. It risks jeopardizing patient lives. Um, and we continue to oppose those kinds of actions. Well, Dr. Ehrenfeld, uh, you know, welcome to leadership uh, in this role. It's a big and, and public-facing role. And I uh, think we can probably uh, say it's safe to say that even within your profession, uh, there's disagreement about the issue. I know in Florida, the state's medical board banned gender affirming care uh, and legal experts fear it could set a precedent for restrictions on other forms of health care uh, in that state. What's the strategy for building support uh, for trans care, even among your physician peers and colleagues? Well, you know, we have a uh, strong policy and I think the strength of the AMA, you know, we've got hundreds of thousands of members, um, is that when I talk to you as uh, president of the AMA, I'm not representing my views. Uh, and I happen to be a member of the LGBT community. I happen to be a longtime champion of health equity, but I'm talking to you today representing our democratically decided policies of the association. And we convene twice a year, more than 190 states, including Florida, specialties, including the Endocrine Society, American Academy of Pediatrics, American Psychiatric Association, to in open session, not behind closed doors, have these debates, have these conversations to set what our policy will be. And we have clear policy that follows the evidence, which is that gender affirming care, health care for transgender individuals is medically necessary, appropriate, indicated, and should be allowed. Well, Very it's, helpful for people yeah, to know. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. And, and uh, uh, putting sunlight on all those issues in, in the public uh, domain is, is so important. And as you said earlier, you know, you, you've helped to train medical students and, and physicians across the country in LGBTQ health care, uh, in addition to transgender care. I'm just wondering what else is the community facing? We recall uh, this summer uh, the concern about the spread of monkeypox, uh, but that seemed to have handled very well, both between the healthcare sector and the gay community. Uh, what are your thoughts? Um, so it's been renamed MPOX, um, just for clarity. And, um, you know, at its peak in, I think, August um, of last year, uh, we were seeing 450 cases a day. Um, uh, the last data was a week ago, uh, March 15th, the CDC reported one case. So mm -hmm. transmission has um, certainly uh, dropped uh, markedly, um, but we're coming into summer. Uh, we're coming into times when people are out about festivals, um, community activities. 
Um, and the best way to prevent transmission is, is vaccination. Um, I've been vaccinated, my husband's been vaccinated, and, and, and the AMA encourages folks um, who are at risk for exposure or transmission um, to step forward if they haven't already been vaccinated um, to do so. It's the best way that we can prevent a resurgence um, of MPOX uh, in the coming months and years. Well, Dr. Ehrenfeld, uh, many, many things on your uh, dashboard and horizon in this role, I know, but I want to turn to the federal budget for a moment. Congresswoman uh, Rosa DeLauro from our state of Connecticut uh, has uh, shared the details about what would happen if Republicans in the House succeed in rolling back discretionary funds to 2022 levels. And one impact is it would mean an estimated $2 million Vulnerable individuals and families would lose access to health care services through community health centers. Obviously, uh, very important to our audience uh, and to us uh, who are engaged uh, in that work and, and in that sector of health care. What's, what's the AMA's uh, work in this area to try and prevent these kinds of reductions in access and funding for health care that might happen if that budget were passed? We cannot allow our Medicaid or Medicare federal health care programs to be devastated. And unfortunately, there are uh, proposals, as you're describing, um, that would take away access to, to millions of patients. That would be devastating. That would damage um, small gains that we've made um, in terms of health um, equity. It would damage um, improvements in coverage that have uh, continued to uh, increase since the passage of the Affordable Care Act. And so we continue to speak out. Um, against any efforts that would take care away from people um, that would reduce funding for those important safety net programs um, and continue to uh, use every lever that we have uh, to promote those policies. You know, there, there's a trend of uh, hospital residents wanting to unionize as a, really as a reaction to burnout and corporate takeovers of healthcare. Uh, the AMA has a recovery plan for American physicians to address burnout. Uh, is union unionization uh, the answer in what does AMA see as a solution? I'm not sure unionization is the answer, but certainly we have to address uh, physician burnout. And that's been a longstanding priority for the AMA. We have a practice sustainability um, uh, effort within the association. And, and what I would say is that, um, you know, it's certainly been a cornerstone of our work for more than a decade. Um, the, the, the transformation that is starting to happen is people's recognition that it's not a personal failure. When when I talk to a resident who, who is overwhelmed, who is at the end of their rope, who is struggling, it's often not because of anything that they did. It's because of the system that they're working in and the stress that we put on them. And so um, the AMA has been trying to work at the system level um, to remove barriers that interfere with how we need to take care of patients, barriers that often are leading to the burnout and dissatisfaction. And as, as AMA president, and I see patients every week. So I, I experience the good, the bad, and the ugly mm -hmm. um, of what it's like to practice uh, medicine in America today. Um, I will certainly continue to lead our efforts to help find solutions um, that go beyond administrative simplification to establish support systems that we know can enable physicians and our students and trainees to thrive, um, but also to address their, their own mental health needs uh, without fearing a negative impact on their their careers. You, you probably are well aware of the uh, passage of the, the Lorna Breen Healthcare Heroes uh, Provider Act last yeah. year. Mm -hmm. That was something that the AMA strongly supported. Um, and, and we continue to look for um, both regulatory and legislative um, and other solutions um, to get more funding uh, so we've got the resources to support the, the mental health needs of physicians. Maybe talk a little more about uh, the the maybe some best practice examples. Uh, I think the number is 63% of all physicians have, have uh, indicated that they're, uh, you know, dealing with burnout. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big number. And I'm wondering if there are, are any best practices around the country as you look around uh, that uh, people may want to emulate. Yeah, so the AMA has actually a whole set of resources that we have developed in partnership with folks around the nation um, including like a 17 step guide available free on our website um, to creating a more resilient healthcare organization um, that can function at an even higher level during a crisis. Uh, and we continue to try to being very practical tools to how can you redesign your workflows? How can you re-engineer the system for how we deliver care um, to reduce these uh, challenges that are, are driving burnout? That being said, there still are these overly burdensome government regulations. There are 
dangerous, damaging, um, heart-wrenching insurance practices like prior authorization that contribute to uh, the system challenges at a local level that we also need to address. Well, we certainly hear you, uh, the contributions of that last issue to frustrations, and thank you for calling it out. But a, a big piece of uh, burnout uh, is uh, the workforce shortage overall, no matter what setting you're in, if the other people on your team are not there, if those positions are open, that's a real contributor. Uh, over the last you know, 30, 40, almost 50 years now, uh, nurse practitioners and also physician assistants uh, are uh, a major part of the health workforce and primary care, very substantial part of the primary care provider workforce uh, in the United States. Certainly, uh, independent practice is the, the rule in many of our states, but I know AMA has uh, lobbied against these changes in the past at times. What's, what's the view at this point at AMA around uh, the role of nurse practitioners and PAs uh, as primary care providers, really as, as providers within our healthcare system where they seem to be playing a pretty vital role? Well, let me just share. I, I work in a care team model. I work with nurse anesthetists. I work with anesthesia assistants. And obviously, I work with, with trainees every week. Um, and it is a wonderful time when you have physician-led team-based care that can lead to the best healthcare outcomes. And nobody should be practicing um, in a vacuum, in a silo, uh, as a one-person show. That doesn't support our patients' needs. That doesn't lead to the best healthcare outcomes. And so the AMA's priority has been to think about how do we lift up physician-led team-based care as the preferred model for healthcare delivery to get to the best patient safety, to get to the best health outcomes. I, I will tell you, in, in the state where I happen to live, um, there was a, a recent call for a, independent practice by nurse practitioners um, by tribal communities. And, and I will tell you that I don't think that we ought to shortchange any community, tribal communities or others, uh, by giving them care that isn't the best care. You know, when the president of the United States is injured or ill, they don't call for a nurse, they call for a doctor. Probably get a fair amount of pushback on that around <laughs> the science for the physician-led teams versus the team, which I think we're all 100% in agreement on, but thanks for sharing that with us. Sure. You know, uh, I'm thinking back to when we started our primary care practice back in 1972, and thinking about the AMA back there, they seem to be very protective of the single shingle. Um, I'm wondering as you sort of think about the transformations that are happening in healthcare, particularly with the large uh, pharmacy companies saying that they're going to employ thousands of physicians in individual practices in corporate medicine. Uh, what's your what's what's the AMA's read on uh, on these large initiatives that really are uh, focused in on? Uh, really transforming the delivery care in America? Well, obviously, you know, the healthcare delivery system continues to evolve. Just look at what's happened with telehealth and remote care and remote patient monitoring over the last three years, right? You know, we've had explosive growth. Uh, we have had uh, an incredible experience in understanding um, how we can use telehealth to better meet the needs uh, and uh, enable convenience for, for our patients. Uh, that requires us to rethink what those delivery models are. Uh, where I get concerned is around the rampant consolidation that's happening in the marketplace, uh, particularly driven by some of the, the insurance carriers. Um, patients should have choices. Um, the AMA policy supports um, you know, a variety of practice modalities. Uh, we don't have a preference uh, for you know, corporate practice of medicine, private practice, you know, those kinds of things. Um, we wanna make sure that the models that are working, that are in the marketplace work for patients. Well, when we uh, think about our recent uh, history, which I'm going to consider all the last three years, our, our recent <laughs> history <laughs> kind of went by in a flash. We were all pretty busy. Uh, but the, the pandemic, uh, in all seriousness, uh, revealed so many things. But one of uh, the, the revelations for many, I think some of us have been aware for a long time, was just the depth of health disparities in our country. And we had uh, the Morehouse School of Medicine founding dean, Dr. Lewis Sullivan, join us uh, recently. And we talked about the fact that only 5% of the physician workforce identifies as African-American. And, and I think what really surprised us was it hasn't budged all that much, given the decades since we started tracking that. Uh, I know that uh, this is probably an issue of concern for uh, AMA. Uh, what's, what's the AMA doing to promote diversity in the profession? 
Well, that concern about diversity in the workforce is an acute issue for us because, as you may know, there's a Supreme Court decision in the Students for Fair Admission versus Harvard uh, in versus North Carolina. There's two cases um, that are considering uh, looking at race in higher education admissions. Um, and uh, the AMA uh, joined with the uh, Association of American Medical Colleges um, in filing an amicus brief in those cases. Um, but the challenge here um, is that uh, there is a real possibility that some of the tools um, that we have today to uh, try to diversify who's getting into college, who's getting into medical school, uh, will be taken from us. Um, and uh, if that does happen, um, as some expect it, it may, uh, we need to be ready to, to respond. You know, the AMA's work to eliminate longstanding health inequities, improve uh, outcomes for populations that have been brushed aside, ignored, marginalized, it requires us to do a number of things beyond just addressing the workforce. Um, it requires us to address structural racism at its core in healthcare and in the healthcare system. That means that we've got to equip my colleagues, physicians with the knowledge and the tools to confront health inequities, to advance health equity across the entire healthcare system. And uh, we created a center for health equity in 2019. Um, that helps facilitate our commitment uh, to embed equity entirely throughout the AMA. Um, it's strengthened and amplified our work uh, to advance uh, equity and eliminate health inequities um, that primarily are, are rooted in uh, injustice and oppression. You know, we recently had the FDA commissioner, Dr. Robert uh, Califf, on our program, and he, he made quite an eyebrow-raising statement that misinformation is the leading cause of death in this country because it's prevented people from getting the COVID vaccine that could have saved their lives. And I note that there was a recent article in the AMA Journal of Ethics also examined the influence of misinformation sources on scientists and found that they're easily swayed surprisingly, as non-scientists. Uh, uh, I'm wondering if you could talk about how the AMA is addressing this uh, really significant uh, problem. So the attack on science combined with misinformation have been damaging. And, um, you know, I would, I would certainly echo uh, those comments um, from our FDA commissioner. Um, you know, certainly some of that has died down. There was so much around vaccination, masking, COVID response um, that was disheartening yeah. uh, online that led families uh, and communities to suffer needlessly. Uh, we can't allow that to happen. The AMA has called um, for action. We've called on the social media companies to regulate their platforms. We've called on state medical boards to take appropriate action if there are physicians who are promulgating uh, things that are untrue and harming patients. Um, but we know uh, that this continues to be an issue. And unfortunately, uh, because science is now political, um, it's not going to go away anytime soon. Well, Dr. Ehrenfeld, maybe I'll uh, I'll give you just a kind of an opinion uh, question uh, for you. And, and this comes in part because I've been uh, studiously reading every editorial in the New York Times about artificial intelligence, chatbots, everything that's been out there, as you probably have. And I, I know that you're a self-described tech guru, uh, so that's a, a good person to ask. Obviously, we're uh, in uh, an era of artificial intelligence now uh, across all platforms, including uh, in healthcare, uh, how is how is this figuring into the conversation uh, with your colleagues at AMA? The the balance between sort of the traditional skills and information uh, and all the new technology that's coming forward, uh, concerns, hopes, aspirations. What are you hearing from your members? Well, um, there's tremendous interest, and, and we do physician surveys uh, year over year to see uh, what adoption, what interest is looking like, and there's tremendous interest in, in AI, AI-enabled technologies, digital health that is consistent over the last uh, not now nine years. Um, my hope is that these technologies actually um, reduce the gaps, reduce health disparities, not worsen them. Um, but there's a real possibility that AI-enabled technologies will actually make things worse. Um, and it requires that throughout the development design implementation stage um, that we have experts who are paying attention uh, to the real world implications uh, for what these algorithms are doing. And there are well-described horrific failures of AI tools and algorithms um, that led to discrimination uh, in healthcare. 
um, and, and I, I won't call out any companies or any names, um, but we simply can't let those things happen. Um, I have tremendous optimism for how these tools will change uh, the work that I do as a physician. You know, when I sit in an operating room, uh, you know, there can be 34 real-time parameters and waveforms on my screens that I'm monitoring. I know there are subtle things that I can't pull out. I know that there are machines and algorithms that could help me see uh, that my patient is taking a turn uh, a minute, five minutes, 30 minutes before I can detect that. Um, that's just the reality. Um, so I yearn for those tools. Yeah. I, I know sure. that they, they are there. And I expect that someday AI won't replace physicians, but physicians who use AI will replace those who don't. Hmm. You know, that's really interesting. And, and as Margaret said, we know you're a self-described tech guru in health. I was thinking, I think I saw today, maybe on Bloomberg, that uh, there was a new round of uh, uh, chatbots, uh, more individualized, you know, and I, I can see the not too far in the future, uh, downloading one's medical record into a chat box and having all of the associated, uh, um, uh, you know, medical terminology, you can have a conversation with it. But as you say, it's very early in the AI world uh, for us to really jump to believe that that's uh, a salvation. But tell us, in addition to what you just shared about some of the technology, what are you excited about when you see some of the technology out there? And I think we we saw not really technology, we saw the, the ability to start using uh, Zoom and audio communications with people, but that's not really tech, but that's that has helped uh, uh, move the, uh, move the uh, agenda forward. But what, what, what excites you from a tech guru point of view uh, that can be supplements to the primary care provider's uh, toolkit? Let me give you an example, and it's the first FDA-approved uh, autonomous AI-enabled system, which is in the diabetic retinopathy space. We do not have enough ophthalmologist in the country right. to screen every diabetic patient for diabetic retinopathy, although that is the indicated standard, right? Because we know that right. diabetes can cause blindness. Um, and so the challenge is, uh, you know, if we can't make thousands and thousands more physicians do these exams, can we use the technology? There is a set-top box uh, from a company spun out of the University of Iowa um, you can uh, put in a primary care office, you could put it uh, in your local grocery store. Um, it requires somebody with a high school education to put a patient in front of it. Um, and it takes pictures of the eyes, the retinas. The AI is so good. The technology is so confident that the company carries malpractice insurance on the device. And it will, with high precision, tell you if the patient has diabetic retinopathy or not. It allows you to then do high throughput screening of patients. So the ophthalmologist doesn't do the initial screening exams, they're seeing the patients with the disease. That changes the game, right? It is a way to amplify the workforce using technology. That example gives me so much hope and excitement for ways that we can use these technologies to really re-engineer work to make it more meaningful, what I do as a physician. Margaret, we've uh, had the opportunity of working with the Arvind Eye Institute in India and our folks yeah. uh, out in California on this particular area. And we're, we're also very excited about this new technology that's been, been in the works for a while. Absolutely, I, I, uh, we're, we're all fans of the same thing. And it's such a great uh, test case example, if you will. It's one that you can really so clearly communicate to everybody, what is the value of this? And it radically certainly improves our uh, chances of getting that all important retinal uh, screen and exam done for our diabetic patients. So thank you so much for, uh, giving that a shout out. And there are so many uh, issues to focus on. I understand uh, that you uh, lead the largest health philanthropy uh, in your state, the Advancing a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment. What would you like to share with us about that work and your, your big goals for that work? Well, uh, my day job is leading the Advancing a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment at the Medical College of Wisconsin. It's the largest health philanthropy in the state. Um, and our vision is pretty simple. It's to make Wisconsin the healthiest state in the nation. The work is hard, and we do that through supporting academic uh, research, workforce development, and community partnerships all around the state. Um, to date, we've invested about $330 million um, in community projects. We work with almost every federally qualified health system uh, in the state. Uh, we work with um, lots of community partners. Um, and what's nice about my day job is that it aligns very well 
with our work to improve health outcomes at the AMA. And certainly I expect there'll be more synergies in the future. And uh, it certainly is an exciting time uh, to work uh, as a philanthropist as well. Yeah, well, that's very exciting. Tell me, you know, one of the uh, models that we've been looking at um, are e-consults uh, to primary care providers. And this is where a uh, specialist, uh, you, our audience probably has heard us uh, talk about this before, where specialists are reaching out to primary care providers who might be in a rural community, who might not have access to, um, uh, to a specialist in their community. Um, uh, our Weizmann Institute has published on this, and you know, 70% of those uh, uh, encounters uh, have allowed for the primary care provider to practice uh, to, to make the treatment recommended by the specialist. But what are your thoughts about this type of, of intervention strategy? I, I think it's very promising. We're, we're looking at trying to scale up an, a, a similar model here in, in Wisconsin. Um, but it comes down to, at the end of the day, how do we support coverage and payment for telehealth services in a way that can scale? And uh, the telehealth expansions uh, that we've seen during COVID um, have been really, really great around um, access for primary care services, not so much on the specialty side. And, and, and that data is if you look at, you know, median referral time and who's actually getting in uh, to see individuals. So I, I do think there are a lot of opportunities. Um, there, there are definitely times uh, when you've got uh, somebody um, who is uh, out in a, in a resource limited area uh, where, you know, the patient doesn't need to go somewhere, they just need someone to call. Um, and right now, we, we often don't have structures to support uh, those facilities, those individuals uh, who are working. Uh, but I think it's a really promising area. That's great. Well, there is so much uh, <laughs> for you to work on uh, and yet so much coming at you all the time. Love for you uh, to comment. We've been talking about burnout and resilience uh, in other people. Where do you draw your uh, personal uh, and professional strength uh, and fortitude uh, to do this work, especially at a time when there is, uh, to put it mildly, uh, often just such a, a tone of disrespect uh, and uh, hostility uh, in the population against some of the things that you've really worked so hard for, like marriage equality, equality uh, in the military. Where, where do you draw your strength and inspiration? Uh, it comes from my family, my kids, and my husband. And you know, as one of the youngest people to hold the office of AMA president yes. as the first openly gay person, as, as the first AMA president to have a child while in office. <laughs> you know, my experiences uh, are, are, are different, right? Um, and they deeply influence my perspective. They give me strength uh, in representing physicians across the nation. You know, as I think about your perspective, how would you describe the things you want to accomplish in this term that you're, you're about to enter? You know, we have lived through a really challenging time with COVID for the last three years. Uh, the AMA, we have our recovery plan for America's physicians that remains a top priority. Uh, we've got to fight uh, the rampant misinformation that we touched on earlier. We've got to create a more equitable healthcare system that meets everybody's needs. And we've got to make sure that as digital health tools like AI are brought into the marketplace, that they're equitable and they're effective. And those are the things that I'm gonna be focused on. Well, Dr. Ehrenfeld, uh, congratulations on the good work that you've done uh, and best wishes uh, in this important role. And thank you to our audience as well. More online about conversations on healthcare, including a way to sign up for email updates. The address is chcradio.com. Dr. Ehrenfeld, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Oh, thank you all so much. Absolutely. Congratulations on all the great work you've done and uh, more to come. So uh, we'll continue to follow your work. Thank you.